let us jump to our first question. The first question states, you have configured a wireless network to operate at a 2.4 GHz using a single 22 MHz channel. Which of the following wireless standards best describe your setup? Is it A, 802.11a? Is it B, 802.11b? Is it C, 802.11g? Or is it D, 802.11ac? You now have 5 seconds. And the correct answer is option B, 802.11b. The IEEE 802.11b Wi-Fi standard was the first Wi-Fi variant to be launched using the 2.4 GHz ISM band. It enabled data rates of 11 megabits to be achieved. It uses a single 22 MHz channel. There are a few things that I would ask you to memorize mechanically for the CompTIA A plus exam and the wireless standards would be one of them, as well as the ports and protocols. Make sure you know the band in which these standards operate and the transfer speeds for each and every one of them. It is not as difficult as it may seem. You will only need to know the specifics for the 802.11a, 802.11b, 802.11g, 802.11n and 802.11ac standards. I cannot stress enough how important it is to memor memorize these standards. You will get questions about this topic. Okay, let us jump to our second question. And the next question states, your manager is organizing a meeting and would like to use his laptop to connect to an LCD projector. When he tries to make the connection between the two devices, the image is not displaying through the projector. Which of the following options should be the first choice in order to resolve this issue? Is it A, power cycle the projector? Is it B, to replace the projector's bulb? Is it C, to use the FN button? Or is it D, to replace the cable? You now have five seconds. Okay, so the correct answer is option C, to use the FN button. If you read the question carefully, we are asked to choose from the presented list of options which one of them would be our first choice. Take your time and think about the question, but don't overthink it because it might lead you to the wrong answer. There is no such thing as trick questions when it comes to a CompTIA exam. You just have to think logically and don't rush. Some questions are extremely easy as this one, so don't panic. Your brain might play tricks on you when it sees a question like this uh, because of its simplicity. You might tell yourself that this question is too easy and it must be a trick question. Don't do, do that. At the risk of repeating myself, there are no trick questions in the CompTI exam. They don't include questions that are misleading. Sometimes the easiest answer is the correct one. In this case, the question also gives us the most obvious answer, and that answer being to use the FN button. Power cycling the projector is the act of turning a piece of equipment, in this case the projector, on and off again. You would need to power the cycle uh, in case you would encounter a crash or hang situation in regards to your projector. Answer B is not a vi viable solution to this issue neither. Uh, you would need to replace the projector's bulb in case there is a flickering image. If there's an indicator light that turns on the projector, uh, many projectors have an indicator light that turns on in order to let you know that you will need to replace the bulb soon. Or uh, in case if there's a color loss, uh, fady colors or colors that seem muddy might be another uh, sign that indicates that your bulb is dying. Uh, the FN key is a modifier key, especially on laptops because of their size restrictions, in order to activate a second function in a dual purpose key. Uh, it is usually combined with other keys such as F11 or F12 in order to perform tasks such as to change the display, turn up and down the volume, mute the volume, switch between windows, control media functions such as play, pause, fast forward, rewind, etc. Uh, replacing the cable could be an option in this case, 
uh, you are presented with an obvious choice the F and button uh, if you are confused like in this case and don't know which one of the two answers to choose from make sure you appeal to the CompTIA troubleshooting methodology uh, what does the second step of the troubleshooting methodology states to establish a theory of probable cause right but most important uh, to question the obvious and in this case it's pretty easy is it not okay I hope I managed to make myself clear enough so far if so let us jump to our third question and the question states Sarah would like to enable DHCP on her desktop computer but she would prefer to have the same IP address every time she boots up her device which of the following options would be the best choice for her to make is it A to use a PIPA? Is it B to use VPN? Is it C to directly connect her desktop computer to a switch? Or is it D to create an IP reservation on the DHCP server? You now have five seconds. Okay, so if you have read the question carefully, we are asked to choose from the presented list the best option for Sarah to make. In this case, it would be option D, to create an IP reservation on the DHCP server. When you use a DHCP IP reservation, you are basically telling your Wi-Fi network to assign the same IP address to a specific device whenever that device connects to your network. Most devices use DHCP which assigns dynamic IP addresses as a default. But sometimes you would like devices to have the same IP address, for example, a wireless printer or a desktop computer. If your printer's IP address is dynamic, it means that it will keep changing and your computer might not always be able to find it. A PIPA or automatic private IP addressing is a feature of Windows that will automatically assign your device with an IP address and subnet mask when a DHCP server is not available. The device chooses its own IP address in the range of 169.254.1.0 through 169.254.254.255 range. The subnet mask is set to 255.255.0.0 and the gateway address is set to 0.0.0.0. .0, .0, .0. It is very important to also memorize and recognize an IP, IP, IPA address when you encounter one. It will always start with 169.254. Uh, whatever, two other numbers. Option B to use a VPN. What does that mean? A VPN, an acronym for Virtual Private Network, offers online privacy and um, anonymity by creating a private network from a public internet connection. A VPN creates a data tunnel between your uh, local network and an exit node in another lo location, which can be hundreds or thousands of miles away, making it seem as if you are uh, in another place. Our question asks us to set up Sarah's device in order to have the same IP address every time she boots up her computer. So using a VPN has nothing to do what, with our question. It is a totally different subject. Option C, to directly connect her desktop computer to a switch. But what exactly is a switch? A switch is a device in a computer network that connects other devices together. Multiple data cables, usually RJ45, are plugged into a switch to enable communication between two network devices. You would normally like to directly connect to the switch in order to perform configuration or maintenance or to connect to the network uh, in case you don't have a wireless NIC uh, network interface card installed in your computer. Another very important thing, make sure you memorize the types of network cables, like for example Ethernet STP or UTP, which stands for Shielded Twisted Pair and Unshielded Twisted Pair, uh, coaxial cables, uh, fiber optic cables, and there are two categories of fiber optic cables, multi-mode and single mode, etc. Also make sure to memorize the types of connectors used for the network connections, like, like for example RJ11, which stands for registered jack 11, RJ45, which stands for registered jack 45, uh, BNC connectors, uh, F connectors, etc. 
the most amazing and fully complete course for both the Comtia 220 1001 as well for as uh, for the Comtia 220 1002 I found online is uh, if you go and look up on YouTube for Professor Messer he posted the full complete course for both course of the Comtia exam and the best part of it is that uh, it is completely free there is no catch to it everything is for free he makes sure to explain everything in the smallest detail so there is no excuse for you to be lazy you have free material from professor messer as well as practice tests that i will uh, continue to post uh, as often as i can having said that let us move to our fourth question and the fourth question states which of the following port numbers is associated with LDAP, LDAP? This one should be an easy one. Is it A, 110? Is it B, 443? Is it C, 53? Is it D, 137? Is it E, 389? Or is it F, 3389? You now have five seconds. Okay, so the correct answer is E, port number 389. You might be wondering why there are six options to choose from, and that is because you will find in your real CompTIA exam similar questions with four, five, or even six options to choose from. I cannot stress enough how important it is to memorize the well-known port numbers. It is not difficult at all there are only 17 of them to memorize this is a list of all the port numbers you will need for your core one exam okay let us jump to our fifth question and the question states which of the following tools is used to check voltages on a power supply is it a cable tester is it b multimeter is it c crimper or is it d punch down tool you now have five seconds. And the correct answer is B, a multimeter. A multimeter, also known as a volt ohm meter, is a handheld tester used to measure electrical voltage, current, amperage, resistance, and other values. Multimeters come in analog and digital versions and they are useful for everything from simple tests like measuring battery voltages to detecting faults and complex diagnostics. A cable tester is an electronic device used to, uh, to verify uh, the electrical connections in a signal cable or other wired assembly. Basic cable testers are continuity testers that verify the existence of a conductive path between ends of the cable and verify the correct wiring of the connectors on the cable. A crimping tool is a device used to conjoin two pieces of metal by deforming one or both of them to hold each other. The result of the tool's work is called a crimp. An example of crimping is uh, affixing a connector to the end of a cable. For instance, network cables and phone cables are created using a crimping tool to join RJ45 and RJ11 connectors to both ends of phone or CAT5 cable. A punch-down tool, also called as a crone tool, uh, is a hand tool used to connect telecommunications and network wires to patch panel, punch-down block, keystone module or surface mount box. The punch-down part of the name comes from uh, punching a wire into place using an impact action. It consists of a handle, a spring mechanism and a removable slotted blade. When the punch-down tool connects a wire, the blade cuts off the excess wire. Okay, now let's jump to our sixth question. And the question states, which of the following components is a printed circuit board or PCB on uh, which memory integrated circuits are mounted, allowing for easy installation and replacement in electronic systems, especially computers, such as personal computers, workstations, laptops, and servers. Remember guys, take your time and read the question carefully. And the options are, is it A, an optical drive? Is it B, a CPU? Is it C, a memory module? Or is it D, a PSU? You now have five seconds.
And the correct answer is C, a memory module. In computing, a memory module or RAM, an acronym for Random Access Memory Stick, is a printed circuit board on which memory integrated circuits are mounted. Memory modules permit easy installation and replacement in electronic systems, especially computers such as personal computers, workstations, and servers. An optical drive is a type of computer disk drive that reads and writes data from optical disks through laser beaming technology. Uh, this type of drive allows a user to retrieve, edit, and delete the content from optical disks such as CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray disks. Optical drives are among the most common computer uh, components. Uh, an optical drive may also be known as an optical disk drive or an ODD. Uh, the core processing unit or CPU is often uh, referred to as the brains of the computer. Whilst the CPU only makes up one of many processing units, it is uh, one of the most important. It is the part of the computer that performs calculations, actions and runs programs. The CPU takes instructional inputs from the computer's RAM, decodes and processes the action before delivering an output. CPUs are in all sorts of devices ranging from computers and laptops to smartphones, tablets and smart TVs. And the last option is the power supply. The power supply unit or PSU is the piece of hardware that converts the power provided from the outlet into usable power for the many parts inside the computer case. It converts the alternating current or AC from your wall outlet into a continuous form of power called direct current or DC that the computer components require. It also regulates overheating by controlling voltage which might change uh, automatically or manually depending on the power supply you, you have. Uh, make sure you memorize the acronyms as well guys. The best source for that is of course the free courses that you can find on YouTube from Professor Messer. Uh, but you can also go to the official CompTIA page and download the exam objectives from there. In the exam objectives, they will give you the exactly uh, exactly the acronyms that you uh, that you will need and what they represent, as well as the port numbers uh, plus other useful content. Okay, let us jump to our seventh question, and the question states. A firewall was configured to block the NetBIOS protocol. Which of the following ports is used by this specific protocol? Is it A, port 110? Is it B, port 137? Is it C, port 143? Is it D, port 161? Or is it E, port 548? You now have 5 seconds. Okay, so assuming that you have learned your ports and protocols, this one should be easy. The correct answer is, you guessed it, it's option B, port 137. This port is associated with the NetBIOS protocol. Make sure that you, uh, if you didn't memorize the ports and protocols, go back on this video and you will find a list of all ports and protocols that are required by the CompTIA exam. Okay, let us jump to our eighth question. And the question states, Mike is working as a network engineer. He was asked to configure multiple operating systems on the same device in order to test an application. He is currently using a computer with 2 GB of RAM and a storage drive with 500 gigabits available free space. Which of the following upgrades should he consider in order to accomplish his task? And we are asked to pick from the following list two correct answers. Is it A, to install two additional storage drives? Is it B, to upgrade the system RAM? Is it C, to install Windows Guest VM? Is it D, to add another PSU? Is it E, to purchase a WAP? Or is it F, to purchase an external storage drive? You now have five seconds. Okay, now I know I can get annoying at times, but I must repeat myself. Read your questions carefully. Don't 
rush and also learn your acronyms when it comes to acronyms in the real exam you'll only see them in this form of abbreviation you won't see their complete naming so if you didn't study them you will have no idea what the answer so the correct two answers are b and c uh, to upgrade the system ram and to install windows guest vm Remember to look out for obvious answers. If you have paid attention to the question, we are not given a specific number of operating systems that we have to install. A device on which uh, we would like to install multiple operating systems should have installed as much RAM as we can in order to function smoothly. Um, you will also have to make sure that you have installed Windows Guest VM. A Guest VM or guest virtual machine is the software component of a virtual machine an independent instance of an operating system called a guest operating system and its associated software and information the guest vm and the host vm are the two components that make up a virtual machine now let us explore why all the other answers are wrong Option A recommends to install two additional storage devices. If you have read the question carefully, you would uh, have noticed that we are given 500 gigabytes of storage space to work with, which is plenty enough for multiple operating systems to be installed. Option uh, D recommends to add another PSU. If you know your acronyms, you will know that PSU stands for Power Supply Unit. There is no point in adding another power supply unit if our existing one is providing the required voltages for uh, all the components. Option E recommends to purchase a WAP. A wireless access point or a WAP is a hardware device or configured node on a local area network or LAN that allows wireless capable devices and wire wired networks to connect through a wireless standard, including Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. WAP's future, uh, feature uh, radio transmitters and antenna, which facilitate connectivity between devices and the internet uh, on, uh, or a network. A WAP is also known as a hotspot. Uh, this has nothing to do our, with our question. It's a totally different subject. And last but not least, option F recommends to purchase an external storage drive. To put it simply, an external storage drive, also known as a portable hard drive, is a device that is connected to the outside of a computer through a USB connection that is often used to backup computers or serve as a portable storage solution. We already concluded that we have more than enough space already installed in our device, so this option is uh, not a viable one either. Okay, let us now try an easier question and you will already be familiar with the uh, what these following tools are used for. Okay, so the next question states, which of the following tools is used in order to punch a wire into a wiring block, which are usually located into a wiring closet or the back of a patch panel? Is it A, a crimper? Is it B, a multimeter? Is it C, a punch down tool? Or is it D, a cable tester? It should be obvious. You now have five seconds. Okay, so if you answered C, a punch down tool, you are correct. If you don't already know what each of these tools are used for, go back on this video and you will see a list which will describe the uses for uh, all these tools. Okay, boys and girls, and we arrived to our last question. Question number 10. And the question states, you are working in a sales department and one of your colleagues reported that every time he tries to print a document on the laser printer, there are two black lines extending from the top of the page to the bottom. Which of the following options best describe his issue? Remember to read the question carefully. Is it A, the ink cartridges are faulty? Is it B, the fuser is faulty? Is it C, the printer is out of memory or is it D the photo sensitive drum is faulty you now have five seconds okay so if you answered option D you were correct the photo sensitive drum is faulty laser printers use a drum with a light sensitive coating to transfer the image of a page and text and the graphics onto a sheet of paper 
Whenever the content of your document page should appear, a static charge makes toner stick to the drum. Uh, if you see one or more thin stripes that run along uh, the page in the direction in which the page uh, moves through the printer, your printer's symptoms point to a scratch around the circumference of the drum. As the drum rotates to apply a page image to a sheet of paper, toner clings to the scratch on the drum and transfers to the page as if it would be part of your document content. Now let, let us explore why the other options are incorrect. Option A states that the ink cartridges are faulty. Usually the first sign that something has gone wrong with your printer cartridge is the poor print quality. Missing colors, smudges and ink blotches are uh, all signs that your printer ink or toner cartridge might be uh, damaged. Some printers will actually warn you if a cartridge is damaged and will uh, just refuse to print. Option B states that the fuser is faulty. But what exactly is a fuser? A fuser unit is a pair of heated roller within the laser printer which creates heat and pressure to fuse toner on the paper. When the paper underwent through the rollers in the fuser assembly, the loose toner powder starts melting and fuses it into the paper so that uh, it will stay in place for a long time. Some of the most common signs of bad fusers are error codes. An error code may uh, appear on the display if your printer is not working properly. You should check the manual of your printer to understand the meaning of the code as well as uh, another sign would be uh, uh, double images. This one is a very common issue associated with a bad fuser. If you notice a double image on the hard copy where the repeated image is lighter than the original text or picture, you should change the fuser unit to get clear prints. And the last incorrect option is C, that the printer is out of memory. But what exactly is a printer memory? Printer memory is memory RAM, or random access memory, built into the printer. Printer memory is separate from a computer memory. All printers come with a certain amount of printer memory installed, but most are upgradable to handle more or uh, larger print jobs. Printer memory is used to store and process print jobs as they are sent to the printer from a computer. After printing, the job is complete, uh, is cleared from the memory to make room for more prints. Uh, printer memory is directly linked to two uh, print characteristics, speed and print quality. More memory allows you to print faster and print larger high quality graphics. If you ever run out of printer memory, the most common symptoms are error messages on the printer itself such as VM error or limit check. Another symptom would be partial print printouts. Uh, when you send your laser uh, printer a job that's too big for it to complete, it may print as much as it can and then stop at the point at which it uh, just runs out of memory. This can produce partial pages or content that splits across pages in a, an otherwise incomplete document. Okay, boys and girls, this concludes our second CompTIA practice test. The two best pieces of advice that I can offer you is to go and use the free content that Professor Messer offers you on YouTube. It is very comprehensive, very detailed, very organized, and the best part of it is that it's completely free. There is no catch to it. Uh, he's probably the only instructor that offers his lectures on this topic for free, both for the CompTIA A plus 221001 as well as for the CompTIA 221002. In other words, for the Core 1 and Core 2 exams. Another piece of advice would be to check the official CompTIA page and stay up to date with the requirements for the exam. I will include the two links for both Professor Messer and for the CompTIA official website in the description of this video. You can download from the CompTIA official website the exam objectives so you know exactly what to study for. Um, you will pass your exam on the first try. It is not that difficult and you don't have to be a genius. It's never too late to make a change in your career and these CompTIA exams are the best place to get introduced to the IT field. That ends our video for today. Please subscribe, like and share it with your friends. If you would like more similar content, please let me know in the commentary section below and make sure to check my channel because I will keep making this type of tests. I hope you found this video helpful and I'll see you guys next time.
All right, so if you answered C, a punch, punch down to a punch. Which of the following tools is used in order to punch a wire into a wiring block, which are uh, usually located in a wireling closet? Wireling? Wireling? Really? Wireling? Fuck. So bad at this English language, man. So, oh. In other words, for the core one and core two exams. Other piece of the. Uh, 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 fuck! 